Welcome to this video about calculating the orbit of a transiting exoplanet. So if we have a look at the amount of exoplanets that have been discovered so far, we can see that there's been a large explosion in the last 10 years. So all the different colours here represent the different method that they've been detected by. And you can see the majority here has been by the green method, which is the transit method, and the one that we're interested in for this particular video. The next most significant one is the radial velocity, which we can cover in a different video. But you can see how there's been a large increase in the recent years, but we've got lots of information about those exoplanets. So how do we actually get them? So if you go onto the exoplanet archive, you can get lots of information and plots of all of the exoplanets that have been discovered so far. So here is one. We've got the radius of the planet in Earth radii, and we've also got the orbital period along the bottom of the exoplanet. Now, one thing you can see straight away is that the orbital periods are fairly small or short, and they're fairly large radiuses when compared to Earth. So we've got a lot of large planets orbiting fairly close to their planet. They're actually easy to detect, which is half the reason. But where do we get that period from? And again, if we were to plot something like the planet mass in Jupiter masses against the orbits of a major axis along the bottom, we can see we've got a distribution here. And again, it's telling us that a lot of large planets are fairly close to their star, just by the way that there's a bias in the detection method. However, how do we get that semi-major axis, which is relating to its orbit? So the easy thing really is the period. So the orbital period, we can calculate by measuring the time between the different transits. So as that planet passes in front of the star, it blocks out some of the light, which you can see by this U-shaped transit. All we've really got to do is wait for it to come back round again on its orbit and detect the next one. So the time between the transits gives us our orbital period. Now, if you've only got the one transit, it becomes a bit more complicated and there are other methods to get the orbital period. But most of the time, if we've got multiple transits, we can get the orbital period fairly easily. So let's take an example which we can work towards. So this is the Kepler 90 system, and we've got quite a few planets here, um, a large number of planets. And let's have a look at the Kepler 90G, which is a fairly large planet, and it has an orbital period of 201.6 days which has been found by the time between the transits detected. So let's try and find out its orbital semi-major axis from that. Now, if we go to Kepler's third law, the orbital period squared P is proportional to the semi-major axis, which is A cubed. So if you create a plot of that, you get this nice straight line when you plot both on the logarithmic scale. So then the orbital period is plotted against the seven major axis. When it's logarithmic, you get this straight line. Now this originally came about through the solar system. So the closer planets, so like Mercury, Venus, all have shorter orbital periods, and they also have smaller seven major axis. So as you get further out, the orbital period increases and you get this particular relationship. So we can use this to work out the orbital or the semi major axis. So at the top, we have an equation which relates to the orbit square of the orbital period. And then on the right hand side, we have the seven major axis, which is A. We have also the gravitational constant, the mass of the star, the mass of the planet, and then you've got your four pi squared on the top. So what we can do is rearrange that for the seven major axis, and we get the bottom expression there. Now you'll note that we don't have the mass of the planet there. And most of the time, the mass of the planet is so much smaller than the star that it can be neglected. So we're just going to write that so that the approximate semi-major axis is given at the bottom there. And the only thing we need in that is the orbital period, which we can detect or calculate from the time between the transits, and then the mass of the star, which we can look at in a different video of how we might get that. So once we've got that orbital period, we can then work out its semi-major axis. So for Kepler 90G, it had an orbital period of 201.6 days, and the mass of the star was calculated to be 1.2 solar masses. So if we put that into our equation, we get a semi-major axis of 1.07 times 10 to the 11 
meters. That doesn't really mean a great deal. So if we put it in terms of astronomical units, where one astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, or the, the same major axis there, we find that Kepler 90g has a semi major axis of 0.715 AU. It's just inside the orbit of Venus as a comparison, so it's fairly close to its star. It's also a fairly large planet as well, so this would be a fairly warm gas giant. So, thank you for watching, and you can also check out some of the other videos where we calculate other properties of exoplanets.